via telephone. The Judiciary Chairman, Senator Charles Trump. Charlie, good morning. Thanks for joining us. Do we have Charlie? Good morning. Oh, there he is. Good morning, Rob and Bill. It's a pleasure to be on with you. Charlie, great to have you with us as well. You made an announcement last week that you will be seeking Justice Hutchinson's seat on the state Supreme Court. Congratulations. Well, thank you very much. I think congratulations are premature. <laughs> <laughs> just announced that I intend to run, but uh, I'm excited about it, Rob. Well, I say congratulations to you. Not that I'm presuming victory. I know it's a challenge anytime an Eastern Panhandle candidate runs for Supreme Court in this state, that that's uh, there's there's not a lot of precedent for paving a way to victory, but you would be as strong of a candidate as uh, anybody I could think of. Charlie, what uh, brought about your thoughts in terms of considering this decision to run now? Well, uh, First of all, thank you for those kind words. I really appreciate that, uh, Rob. It it uh, it was abrupt. My thinking was abrupt. I was not planning, you know, there are two seats that are up on the court, and I, like everyone else in West Virginia, I think have been assuming that the two incumbent justices, Justice Hutchison and Justice Bunn, would both be seeking reelection. Uh, next year, and uh, so I had given no thought, really, to running uh, against either of them, uh, and uh, last Thursday, uh, Justice Hutchison announced that he intended not to seek re-election in 2024, so, um, you know, that it, it's something, serving on the court, on the Supreme Court, is something that I've thought about for a long time, but the timing had never seemed right. Uh, before and so uh, things changed last Thursday. Charlie, we've had this discussion in the past in terms of uh, Eastern Panhandle folks who have served on the Supreme Court. Do you know who the last person to do that was? Uh, it's it's been it has there hasn't been one to my knowledge since the 19th century. I think there was a Supreme Court justice from Jefferson County in the late 1800s. And I don't remember his name. <laughs> Bill Bill does. does. <laughs> yeah, I was around, Charlie. I, I knew him. <laughs> yeah, we had to they, get that they, Yeah, they, I get uh, picked on pretty severely here just because I'm a couple months older than Rob. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Charlie, I, I think uh, when, when you look at uh, your qualifications for Supreme Court justice, uh, there's uh, a few things that stand out. Uh, and, and, and one, of course, would have to be knowledge of the law. And uh, clearly you check that box. I think another one is disposition and the ability to just simply weigh the law and uh, fairness in coming to a decision. And I have to say this, uh, and I think Bill will agree with me, uh, of the people that I know, I can't think of a person who better fits that description than you. I don't know anybody who has a, an unkind word to say about you in, in terms of your fairness, your knowledge of the law, your ability to apply restraint, uh, take a motion out of a situation and interpret it. And I, I go back to the campaign you just ran. You had, shall we say, a non-traditional candidate that was opposing you in the debate who was coming at you with some stuff. And uh, it would have been, I thought, perfectly reasonable to expect some type of snapback on some of your replies, but you didn't. You were entirely gracious and answered everything with respect to your opponent, even though I don't know you were necessarily getting that in return. And that, to me, was very impressive. Well, thank you for saying that, Rob. It, it's important to me. And I know, boy, you've got in the studio with you a person who has uh, planted a flag uh, on, the, on that very question the importance of civility uh, in public discourse, and I really and truly believe it. I, I think um, now, and it's especially true, uh, it's especially important uh, for uh, a member of the judiciary. Anybody who's serving in judicial office, you know, has to maintain uh, an even temperament and patience. You know, there are... Um, there are reasons that you hear the expression patience of a judge uh, because it's a it's a high and laudable attribute when 
when you see judicial officers act in that manner, it's a really important part of the, making that process work for people. And uh, so I would hope, I would certainly hope to live up to, to, to that uh, were I to become uh, an associate justice of the Supreme Court of Appeals. Bill? Yeah. Uh, good morning, Charlie. Uh, good morning, Bill. Uh, bef- uh, picking up on what Rob said about how how high regard you're held in everybody's eyes. Uh, years before I met you, uh, I think you were still serving the House. Your ca- your name came up with a group of us uh, were just kind of discussing uh, local politics, and the comment was made then that uh, Charlie Trump could have any seat he wanted, any office he wanted in the state of West Virginia. He was held in that high regard. Everybody in the group said the same thing. Uh, Again, I did not know you at the time. Since then, I understand why they were saying that, because you are a man of high caliber. You're you're honest. You're, You're you're very forthright. So uh, everything Rob said earlier, I agree with. Let me ask a couple of questions, though, before we have a chance to, now that we've embarrassed you. Uh, <laughs> but the, uh, uh, you were very quick into making your announcement, uh, which I think was very wise. Uh, do you have any idea who might also be running for the Supreme Court? No, I, I don't really. And, of course, you know, it's a statewide office. Justices of the Supreme Court of Appeals are elected you know, at large across the entire state. So uh, there are, uh, the, you know, the requirements are you have to have been a practicing attorney for 10 years, uh, but uh, I don't know how many uh, such people meeting that qualification are, but thousands literally in the state. And uh, I don't know, and it, it's not something I've given a whole lot of thought to because it's, it's certainly beyond my control. You know, I will tell you this, uh, (laughs) the last time there were open seats up for election on the Supreme Court of Appeals, there were 10 candidates in each division. So I'm not going to be shocked if there are a number of candidates. Uh, And I... You're probably right there, but I guess I'm uh, was more curious about the quality candidates. Uh, a lot of folks just throw the name in the ring for their 15 uh, seconds of fame, uh, whereas uh, I'm not sure there's going to be a lot of folks of that of quality stature that would be want to take you on because you are well known. You're exceptionally well respected. So, but you're right. Uh, as the old uh, saying goes, you either run unopposed or you're unscared one of the two yeah and there's just no way to know Uh, it's like every other office filing opens actually formally opens in january you know so i haven't filed i couldn't file yet uh i couldn't file now if uh you know if i wanted to because the legal filing period begins in january and so uh, there really is no way to know or predict uh, who else might offer himself or herself up as a possible candidate uh, for uh, one of those seats? They are um, nonpartisan elections now, so the election is held. The final election is held in May. Senator yeah. Charlie Trump, our guest here on the program, Judiciary Chair, and as uh, of last week, declared himself a candidate for the state Supreme Court. Go ahead, Bill. Now, one of the disadvantages of uh, uh, ha- having a Supreme Court seat is I th- assume you'd have to move to Charleston. Is that correct, or could you do this uh, just traveling back and forth? Well, I'd have to spend a lot, a lot of time in Charleston, to be sure, Bill. Mm-hmm. You know, the court uh, has two terms, and it's basically in session. Those two terms uh, stretch it across uh, the in- basically the entire year. There's some time out between terms in the summer and then at the very end of the year. Uh, But I'm uh, accustomed to driving back and forth between uh, the Eastern Panhandle and Charleston. And uh, I would expect I'm going to be a good bit of time in both places. Yeah, you. Uh, I think you appeared on uh, statewide radio a couple uh, last week sometime. Uh, what was the response from uh, uh, the throughout the state when you made your announcement? It, it's been really heartwarming. I, I've had a lot of uh, 
you know, phone calls and texts uh, from uh, and emails from people who uh, seem excited about it and have said nice things. And I had some of those in advance of my announcement, you know, sort of encouraging me to, um, you know, announce that I or suggest that I should uh, announce that I was going to get in into the race and become a candidate next year. So all of that is um, a little bit humbling, to be honest. Yeah, I think uh, we're living a partisan world now. Everything is Republican or Democrat, and it's hard to find the middle. Uh, fortunately, the Supreme Court is nonpartisan. Also, I think there is a real hunger within us, with the voters, the constituents, to find someone that uh, rises above the partisan battles, the partisan uh, 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 barbs is thrown, uh, that someone that is capable, someone that's honest, someone that's forthright, and someone that can relate to the people. And, uh, and I'm coming back to what Rob said earlier. Uh, I think you check all these boxes. So I think there's, I'm, I'd be very surprised if you're not embraced by the state as a whole because you're well known and everybody knows you're a man of cal- character. Well, I certainly hope that's true. I don't know how well known I am, but you know that's the purpose of a statewide campaign. Uh, I'll be honest; that's a little daunting for me. You know, I've run uh, a Senate campaign uh, across four counties, but a statewide campaign uh, in West Virginia is uh, a little bit intimidating. I confess, it's a big state and hard to get around in sometimes. But one of the great things about a campaign is you, you get to meet lots of people that you probably never otherwise would meet. And so while it's exhausting, I've always enjoyed that uh, part of you know the political process. Yeah. Uh, running the campaign statewide uh, costs money. And the fact it's nonpartisan, how will a Supreme Court candidate candidate for Supreme Court, uh, find, do- uh, find money to support the campaign? So, you know, it's interesting because it's very different the way it works and is, is required to work uh, from legislative races or executive branch races. Candidates for judicial office are prohibited uh, by the canons of judicial conduct from asking people to contribute uh, to their campaigns. Now, they're they are allowed to form a campaign committee uh, that s- sort of does that necessary fundraising for the candidate, but judicial candidates are not supposed to, uh, you know, ask people for contributions. Let's take for that very one, good reasons. Yeah, let's take that one step farther. Uh, are you prohibited of advertising, and and how are you, is there restrictions on how you advertise? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely there are. The, the advertisements of a judicial candidate seeking elective office have to conform uh, to the canons uh, of, judi- of the code of West Virginia Code of Judicial Conduct. And so, um, yeah, some of the things that you see in other kinds of political races you should uh, not see in a judicial race. And he can't talk about positions he has on issues, yeah. for instance. But he can tell people, "I'm Charlie Trump running yeah. for uh, Supreme Court justice." Yeah, along. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, are you more or less limited to a lot of personal appearances, a lot of handshaking uh, at groups, and a, a debate among the other candidates? Is there are there other forms that you can pursue besides these two? Well, I'm sure all. All the above on those, and uh, I would expect that to be the case. That there will be, you know, lots of events uh, where people expect to see candidates, and judicial candidates are permitted to attend those, uh, but they um, they have to act in uh, fundamentally a nonpartisan manner. Uh, you know, the races, the judicial races in West Virginia, used to be partisan affairs. And you ran as a Democrat or Republican for the court, uh, for judge, for justice, for magistrate. We changed all that in 2015, I guess, or 16. Uh, It was early in uh, my career in the Senate 
We passed the bill to make all those races nonpartisan uh, because, in truth, the role of a judge, a jurist, a justice, is different than the role of a legislator. Uh, legislators have as their job, you know, a debate about what the law should be. And that really is outside of what we want judicial officers to do. Uh, judicial officers are uh, responsible to give an impassion, impassioned and uh, dispassion, I should say, dispassion, exposition, and opinion of what the law actually says and the interpretation of it, not what the, the judge, what he or she thinks the law should be. That's the fundamental, that's a fundamental difference between uh, the role of a legislator and the role of a judge. Charlie, there was some momentum recently in Charleston about returning that to a partisan election for Supreme Court justices. Does that still have uh, any legs to it, or is that dead now? Well, it, it, it died during the um, uh, 2023 regular session of the legislature. Of course, you know, it's not... Uh, uncommon for bills to get reintroduced, sometimes year after year after year. But um, I'm among those who think that uh, the, the nonpartisan election of judicial officers, you know, I, I wrote uh, advocating that 30 years ago, uh, because in truth, there should not be a Democratic or Republican view of what you know, Rule 404B of the Rules of Evidence means uh, there shouldn't be uh, Democratic or Republican interpretations of what the text of law says and means. Um, the judiciary is and should be held to um, a different standard. Charlie, when would the term expire for this seat? Justice Hutchison's term expires in December of 2024. So his successor uh, will be elected in May and commence service in January of 2025. And when would that term expire? They're 12 year terms. Mm -hmm. So they're consistently on 12s now. There was a I guess when you do an unexpired term, those are the shorter terms than when they started this, like four and six years or right. whatever. Right. And because of the length of the term, it happens. The people, you know, die, re retire um, before a term is completed. Uh, and so then you have people elected to fill unexpired terms. Charlie, I, I realize you are not allowed as a candidate to stake out a position on any upcoming issue. Uh, so I'm not asking you to do that. But do you see some major issues on the horizon that you that will be in front of the Supreme Court in, the, say, the next 12 or 13 years? Oh, uh, you know, I think um, I, I think it's a very exciting time. I want to say this on the record, and I'll say it on the air. I think we have a great Supreme Court. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'd like to think that I would be able to make a contribution to its important work. But you know, many issues that the legislature grapples with end up being reviewed or interpreted in the Supreme Court. It is the Supreme Court's responsibility, ultimately, uh, it is the final arbiter of the meaning and interpretation of the West Virginia Constitution. Uh, that's very important to me. Uh, you know, I, we all, all public officials take an oath to the Constitution, uh, but members of the judiciary have have to have the final word as to, uh, well, I'll say the people have the final word as to what it says, what it means. Um, but the judiciary uh, plays a very important role be, because the Constitution is the U.S. Constitution and the West Virginia Constitution are what protect and safeguard the liberties of the people. Charlie, I've got a couple of questions for you. Uh, from our Facebook audience, one is, are you permitted to use any funds you have left from your previous Senate campaigns to run for Supreme Court justice? It's a great question. And to be honest with you, I, so I haven't yet formed a campaign committee and I haven't researched that, but I will. I will research that. And, of course, 
um, would uh, do that only if it is permitted under both the Secretary of State's rules and the statutes and the judicial canon. And then the follow-up to that, and this is not the other one, but this is just a follow-up to that answer, which is if you can't use those Senate funds, what happens to those funds that you had uh, in your campaign just for running for re-election for Senate? Well, there is a statute that addresses what can, uh, what can be done with excess funds uh, that are not utilized or needed to be utilized during a campaign, and it lists a number of things. And one of them is other campaigns. One of the things is that it allows those expenses to be or those excess funds to be used in part to defray uh, expenses of serving in the office, uh, which the um, uh, office holder uh, holds. Uh, the law permits, I believe, uh, donations to charitable organizations, too. And then the last one is, and I kind of—I know we covered this before, so I'd need the we're short on time. The Reader's Digest version of it, and it's from Jeff Haddix. The only recent criticism I heard about Charlie Trump is when he used a slick move to bring the marriage age bill back to the floor when the committee voted it down. It was a slick move, and some were very angry about it. Can you revisit that for us? Well, I, I don't know that uh, I will agree necessarily with the adjective slick. <laughs> it's generally not uh, a complimentary adjective. Uh, I made a motion uh, to withdraw the bill from the committee. And it's a motion that is uh, specifically provided for in the Senate rules, uh, and with good reason, under the theory that a committee of, the, of a legislative body, in this case the Senate, should not be able to withhold from the entire Senate a consideration of a bill. And so our Senate rules provide that a majority vote of the members of the Senate may withdraw a bill from a committee and bring it to the floor for consideration. And you, um, you need that on occasion if, you know, you can imagine a, you know, a chairman who just says, I refuse to schedule this bill on the agenda. And so the, the bill had failed. Your, your caller or your, um, your uh, Facebook uh, contributor is correct. It had failed by a vote uh, in the committee, uh, by one vote. And um, I, had, I had reason to believe that the bill, if we amended it some, and we did uh, on the floor, that it might pass uh, the entire Senate. And, and it did by a fairly comfortable margin. So... Um, what what occurred there was absolutely within and and prescribed as part of the rules of the Senate for uh, our processes. Thank you for the recap of that. I appreciate that in a timely fashion, too. Bill, did you have a final comment before we let Senator Trump get to his day? Uh, yeah, uh, we have the Eastern Panhandle has grown sizably in population and influence, uh, yet the power base of the government and uh, Supreme Court is in Charleston. Is there any possibility at all that there be a uh, that the Supreme Court would spend some of the time in the Eastern Panhandle? Uh, you know what? That's a great idea, and I will say to the credit of the current court, because I had nothing to do with this, they do. They do hold. They held hearings, uh, arguments in Morgan County not that long ago, um, a couple of cases, and they've been to other places as well. I know they have held court at the WVU College of Law in Morgantown, uh, at Marshall University, and I think I think they may have plans. They generally try to do that. I think at least once a year at some place in West Virginia, other than uh, the court's chambers in, in the Capitol building in Charleston. And I think that's a great idea. Um, I remember when the uh, Supreme Court heard arguments at our relatively new courthouse in Berkeley Springs. Uh, they had a couple, uh, well, the room was full of middle school age kids that, you know, their teachers had brought them down to watch that argument and the court's work. And uh, yeah, to to your point, Bill, I, I think it's a great idea, and the more we can show our eastern panhandle to uh, folks from all around the state of West Virginia, including the, its institutions of government, the better, as far as I'm concerned. 
Charlie, thanks so much for your time this morning, and best of luck to you in your quest to attain a seat on the Supreme Court. Gentlemen, thank you both. Thank